Hello, everybody. Chef Marcus Giuliano here. Welcome to In the Weeds, Real Tales from the Restaurant Industry. I'm super excited today. I have um, a great guest today, an amazing guest, uh, Michelle Francone or Falcone? Falcon. 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 Michelle yeah. Falcon. All right. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a restaurateur um, to my ever dismay. Uh, I'm joking. I love my job. It is a phenomenal industry, serving people and having their given, you know, it's such an emotional product we have. We have the opportunity to really make somebody's day. Um, but we also have an opportunity to make our team members not just day, their career. Uh, and that's what I, I love. Uh, I wrote a book in 2018 um, that um, thankfully became a, a bestseller um, called People First Culture, uh, Build a Lasting Brand by Shifting Your Focus from Profits to People. Now, um, I do believe in building a profitable business, but there's a there's a right way to do it. Uh, one that um, is with benevolence, uh, one where you put the the people first and uh i can sleep well at night because i know our team members are are doing well for themselves financially they're learning and the outcome is a great customer experience that customers want to come back and see again and again uh you marcus we're going to chat about all things team team building recruiting and um i'm going to share all the strategies that i use well for as much time as we have I, i've got awesome. a bunch um i'm not gonna cut you off. i'm not gonna cut you off we can make multiple episodes and do whatever we have to do. I think what you have, your knowledge on this is, is important. I think people need to hear your message, whether they, uh, it's broken up in a couple of pieces or they do it one go shot or they have to listen to it again. Uh, I think you have some really important stuff that everybody right now is facing in this industry. So, you know, yeah, the team building well, the culture, um, manpower and people, getting people to getting people to show up, getting people for interviews, getting, you know, letting people love their jobs and showing people how, your model is a is profitable uh so, yes yeah. and look we look i i have nothing to hide i we run at 19 percent even though we've had zero turnover in five months and and i'm and and this is uh for a fast growing uh fast casual restaurant brand like zero turnover zero late zero sick and this is like i'm even surprised by these results i graciously surprised um but my my career wasn't always in the restaurants. Um, I, from 2007 to 2012, I worked for a company that taught me the value of company culture. I lived in Vancouver at the time and uh, the company was a very obscure industry. Uh, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. You pay them and they get rid of stuff you no longer want in your house or your business. But um, that company is such a true entrepreneurial success story going from a guy in a pickup truck to $300 million a year, private company, zero debt, zero fine, or sorry, zero uh, outside investors, just a true business. And it was early on that I was like, wow, customer uh, company culture really pays. Um, so I, I had, that was my real world MBA. And then from 2012 to 2016, I, I became a management consultant working for myself, um, very humble beginnings. So I had to move back in with my parents um, in my mid twenties, working from their kitchen table um, and working with uh, at the beginning, small companies to help them with their company culture and their customer experience management strategies. Uh, and then one day Verizon Wireless called. And, and uh, I, I, at the time I was like, I didn't know what a W-9 Ben tax form was. I didn't know how to write a proposal for these or go through procurement of a huge company like this. Um, but throughout my uh, tenure as a management consultant, uh, I had seen many different industries from Alfa Romeo to Lexus to Blue Cross Blue Shield. But the commonality all those industries have with us as uh, restaurant leaders is it, it really is all about people. And, and, and if you can see that, you know, the mile ahead of you is going to be a lot more clear. Like if you can subscribe to that genuinely, it's going to aid your decision making. Uh, you're not going to ask what's the ROI of doing this for my team members. You just know it's good business. Uh, but then I got really lonely, Marcus, um, traveling, flying um, from city to city by myself because I was, you know, a solopreneur. 
And I wanted to be a part of a team. I was, you know, I, I took for granted what I have again, being a part of a team building with colleagues collaborating. Uh, so I moved to Toronto to start a hospitality company with my business partners. Uh, so from 2016 to 2020, just before the pandemic, I uh, built a hospitality company with my partners. We went from zero to $20 million and 200 employees in uh, less than two years. So that, that was challenging. Now, and these were large format restaurants, like 9,000. Oh, yeah, when you say hospitality industry, you're talking restaurants. Yeah, yes, yes. So uh, large format, 7,000, 9,000, 16,000 square foot venues, multiple floors. Um, it, it was challenging. So you basically um, picked the hardest industry to start a team in. You basically yeah, said, I'm going to go for yeah. the hardest industry and do this. <laughs> well, it, it it's a testament to this DNA matter I have is I become disengaged maybe even bored if the challenge isn't really hard for me. Um, so I, you know, management consulting became easy. Um, so then I was like, well, let me go to this industry. This seems hard. Um, and we did well. Uh, but then uh, for many reasons, I wanted to venture off on my own and start a fast casual restaurant brand. I want to do, um, I'm Canadian Peruvian. So if if individuals listening know anything about Peruvian culture and gastronomy, cuisine, uh, Peru is the largest exporter of organic coffee in the world. They're the largest uh, exporter of quinoa in the world. They're the potato capital of the world with 4,000 different types of potatoes, 100 different types of corn. Um, Chef Nobu, his restaurants are Japanese Peruvian restaurants known as Nikkei. His first restaurant that he owned and operated was in the 1970s in Lima, Peru. Like it goes on. And yes, and okay. um, maca and, and, and cacao are Peruvian. Oh, yes. It, it goes on and on and on. So I was like, can I do what Starbucks did for Italian coffee or what Chipotle even did for the burrito in America and create a brand around it? Now, I know many people are going to say that's not traditional Mexican food. I agreed, but they created a brand that was really compelling right, to right. North Americans. So that's what we're trying to do with Brass Peruvian Kitchen is have millions of people try the flavors of the country. And while we have your attention, we want to teach you about all the things that I just mentioned, but also the art, um, the music, the history, the textiles. Um, and uh, we've opened two locations during the pandemic. Uh, leases three, four, and five are signed. So we will be at five units uh, within 15 months. Uh, and, and that was hard. <laughs> the pandemic, uh, uh, working around the pandemic. And you're, and you're, you're in Tor a Toronto area? Is that where you're I'm at? in Toronto. Yeah, it's worth okay. noting too. Toronto was the most locked down city in the world. Sure was, right? In the world. That's, you're probably, That's not you're probably, something I brag about. No, you probably just were able to get seating back, what, eight weeks ago, 12 weeks ago? Yeah, then, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. And um, I was following that. And it, yeah. yes. Now I'll, I'll say, fast casual restaurants did well, right? During that. And like, I, you know, it's, it's, it, it was advantageous for, for our business, right? So I saw the window of opportunity. I said, let's go. Um, and, you know, at, amongst all of our efforts, uh, my time is slanted greatly toward the team, the culture, how we recruit, how we interview, how we onboard. So how many uh, locations how, are you currently, currently operating? Two right now, the third is in construction, four okay. and five is going into. Four five. Okay. How involved are you in the operations of, of, of the restaurants? Uh, very. So my days look like I will work on strategic initiatives for the quarter with our director of operations, but then I'll also go to our stores and do site visits. Uh, every store we open, I will be there for the first two weeks. Now, when is that uh, going to be achievable at? great scale probably not the numbers will beat me eventually but i'm always there for the first two weeks so you're not you're not just an investor hours. putting money in no, no, walking no, no, away no. somebody else run the show you're involved no. you're directing you got okay good perfect yeah i have to you know one thing i learned at 100 got junk is inspect what you expect like if i expect no fingerprints on the glass of our line well, I got to go see that, right? If I expect the music to be at a certain volume, I got to go see that. Um, no, very involved. Right. right. I went to a restaurant last night and the wine glasses were dirty. Every time I go to this restaurant, the wine glasses are dirty. They have streaks mm. in them, smears. And I keep, I, this is the third time now in six months. And I return the glasses to the bar. And, and the excuse I got last night was um, it's our water. Our water system here 
just leaves these leaves us on there. Meanwhile, all the other restaurants in town on that block don't have a glass problem. Yeah, I um, you know, for me, that's obviously uh, that's attention to detail, right? Yeah. And my thing is, does the toilet paper go over or under? That's always so every- a debate, right? Is it is this a debate? I mean, I mean, I, I've been hearing this for years. You know, are you well, wealthy? Are you not wealthy? It, What's your mindset? I'm, I'm, I mean, I've heard all kinds of things about under or over. So for me, it's over. If you look at the patent, the U.S. patent of toilet paper, it's, it's over. over. Okay. It's over. Okay. So now why am I caring about toilet paper? My team members know that, hey, if Michelle comes into the unit, one of the first things that he's going to look at is, is the toilet paper going over and under? Now, why? Do I care that much? No, it's an internal cue for a reminder of attention to detail that extends everywhere. Our customers aren't going to be like, wait a second, this goes under. I'm not going to shop here anymore or dine here anymore. It's for us. It's like for you internal. So you must have heard the story about Van Halen, correct? With it with. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So David Lee Roth, Van Halen, they set up a show and they have very specific instructions on, on everything. Right. But in their waiting room, in their room, in their lounge, m ms with no green m ms so mm. a bowl of M&M's, no green M&M's. That's the first thing they inspect. Because if there's like green it. M&M's in the bowl, what's wrong with their sound system? What's right. wrong with other things? They, did, they couldn't do something that simple. And just like the toilet paper. Now, the toilet paper, you're going over. And a lot of hotels like to put a little emblem there and a little sticker, right? And fold mm-hmm. it over. And if you go under, you can't do that. That's true. That won't That's hold true. on there, right? So... I don't want to live in a world where there's under rolled toilet paper. <laughs> so for me in my restaurant, I'm both details, details, details. I want to be able to walk into my restaurant and know if a table has had dessert already, if they've had their entrees already. And if I know salt and pepper shakers are on the table, they're still waiting for savory food. Yeah. If salt and pepper shakers are off the table. Now I know they're past their savory foods into sweets, into dessert or whatever. And and it takes a while to get staff to buy into that. But I'm like, if you're forgetting something that simple, you're forgetting to put a bottle of water on the ticket. And right. And they're supposed to, you're supposed to have a system to begin with for the bottled water, but things get missed. And so there's other things that are missing that are causing us money, customer service, and um, just flat out simple service etiquette is, yeah. is being missed. You don't need salt and pepper shakers when you get your bill presented clean the table up. You have no idea how long the people are going to sit there and, and, and lounge and this and that. And, you know, and keep busting the table like they were there. Even if they've paid, keep the service going. See if they want anything 15 minutes later, if they're sitting there and catching up. You never know if someone wants an espresso or a cappuccino or or decides they want something else, even to make a reservation for the following day because they're still in town. Great customer experience is such a good sales tactic too. If, if you continue, I, you know, chef, if I come to your restaurant and your team member is just you know, fire on all cylinders, attention to detail, this and that. When you ask if I want a cappuccino, ordinarily I say no, but maybe this time around, I'm like, I kind of want to stay here a little bit. I feel good about myself here. Things are going well, right? Adding $3 here to every check, like that, you know, customer experience. It pays. adds up. It adds up. Uh-huh. Exactly. All right. Excellent. So um, you're, you're involved in the restaurant. You're growing, you're growing the brand. Um, attention to details. Keep talking about your attention to details. And, and let's talk about, um, do you want to jump into, Recruiting first or culture building? I can talk but, about both of them because I see them as one in the same. Okay, and I was going to what comes first, or I mean, I mean, uh, obviously, obviously, you need culture to recruit, but if you don't have culture, you can't. I mean, you, you, take it away. Take it away. Yeah, like for me, culture is the foundation of every great business. It sounds like a platitude, but it's true. Like if if you're trying to build a, a skyscraper, you're gonna worry about the pool on the rooftop or are you going to make sure the foundation of the business doesn't crumble right um and that that comes with you know your mission your vision your values why would anybody want to join right like your core values are the invitation to the party right every great party in your personal life is um has great things to it like great people and great people will congregate and and be attracted by the values of the company now Creating values is very easy. I just write a bunch of stuff down. I send it to a designer and say, design this and let me imprint it so I can put it on my wall. Done. 
my values are done. My culture is done. That's maybe like step one, A, 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 A. Like um, now it's how do you reinforce it, right? Every day. Um, and that's where most businesses miss across all industry, all industry. And, and remember with my background in, in man, um, uh, management consulting, I, I've seen many businesses and that's one of the commonalities. Now for us, it's like the core values are, uh, a description of you know the the party and what it represents so one of our core values is um uh, hospitality sorry um the one that i like the most rather and it's hard for me to determine which one i like the most but it's kind of polarizing it's different it's uh, only the paranoid survive and what i mean by that is having a culture of individuals that know tomorrow has to be earned Right, like we celebrate today, we get great customer feedback today. We almost have to have amnesia and move on to the next day. So that's not for everybody, right? Like that constant pushing and pushing and pushing is not for everybody, right? And I understand that. And we're not for everyone. And sometimes we interview individuals, and I'm fully transparent about what the culture of the company is like. It's pretty intense. We're like a, a symphony. We're like a, a Cirque du Soleil show. Everyone has to be great. Right? Imagine if the uh, acrobats in the Cirque du Soleil, somebody wasn't that good. Well, there's going to literally be death, right? Like there's going to be danger, broken bones. It's um, now, it's a show. Exactly. It's a time. Or a professional sports team that always happens to be in the finals, let's say. Um, we see ourselves this way. And it's something that I've kind of learned from Netflix and some other companies. Um, that's, you know, you really have to be able to paint a picture of what it is like to work within your organization before you can start recruiting. I like that. So, so envision like somebody coming to work for you or applying. Is that what it's Okay. So, well, so you have to be able, well, like it goes into the job description, for example, that is the main asset. And I'm taken back by how irregularly job descriptions are actually updated. They like, it's, it's like, oh, I wrote it. I don't know, let me dust this thing off. But it's been like five years since I updated it. Well, one, does it excite people? Does it like, dance um i hired just for a nominal nominal amount on uh, upwork.com i hired a copywriter to look at my job description and really because i'm not i'm not a a, a a wordsmith so i hired this copywriter to really massage the language so it's a good representation of us but somebody reads it and they're like i can't wait to get to the next paragraph because how many job descriptions have you read that are academic boilerplates right and, boilerplate and honestly plated? most most companies keep their job descriptions a secret it's, it's, really <laughs> a lot of restaurateurs like there's no formal job description you oh, know sure right can you cook come on you can cook yeah. what you got right <laughs> You know, do you have a pulse? Yeah. You're, You're hired. <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, it's, it, the job description is a big secret. I mean, they're told either you're doing a great job or you're doing a bad job. Um, so, yeah. so, so, so let's pretend I'm, let's pretend I'm opening up a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I've got years of experience. I'm opening up a restaurant. So I don't branch off into, to my own, on my own business now. Where, how, how does a newbie like this start a culture like where, where do you start how do you develop a culture like like what like what is your why and and how, how do you find out what your why is and, and your mission yeah. well the good thing about it is if you venture off on your own to be a restaurant this is your business you can build it however which way you want right and you have to understand that you're not going to win everybody over but you're not trying to do that since so when has a great house party ever been with every single person that just walked by the house got to be selective on who you invite to the party based on how you define success. That's the advantageous part of being a restaurateur. Now, from there, um, you do really have to paint a picture of like, what type of values do I want within this company? It literally, now the pandemic allowed me to pause for a bit. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It took me 10 months to finalize my core values. And the reason why, and it, it shouldn't necessarily take everybody 10 months, but I'll, I, I would 
go for a walk. I do my best thinking when I'm just walking and just sitting in isolation at a park or something. And I would just bring my notebook and start writing things that matter to me. All right. What matters to me is that people that work with our brand are kind people. So that is one of our um, core values is hospitality mindset. How can you have a great, be great at hospitality if you're not a kind person? Bingo. Uh, I once, yeah, I once read, um, uh, referring to Netflix again, uh, and, and, you know, I, I reference these multi-billion dollar companies, but you would be surprised how many things you could learn from a big company like that, even if you're a small, smaller brand without the resources. So what I learned from them was, um, they say, uh, they won't tolerate brilliant jerks because the cost of teamwork is too high. So think about, the chef who is an artist and, and such a great crafts person, but they have that ego. Uh, and this could be anybody. It could be an accountant. It could be a marketer, but they perform, right? They perform. They're often protected by the owner because they perform, but they alienate everybody else. That's so short-term thinking uh, if you're trying to build something great for years and decades to come. Um, so for me, like kindness really matters, but for the next person, they might not put as much value on that. So take a piece of paper, take a book, write down all the behaviors that you want in your company. And that is going to form your core values. Uh, another uh, uh, value that we have is cost conscious and high risk tolerance. Like we're trying to open a hundred units by 2027. That's very risky, but on the other side of risk is great opportunity and cost consciousness. Why are we giving each customer three napkins when one will do what, who needs three napkins, right? Why are we doing this and that? And, you know, if we over portion our food, Food, well, guess what? You're just stealing from yourself. That means we have less money to pay you because our costs are too high. All right. So um, for the for the restaurateurs that are wanting to take culture more seriously, it starts with you. Um, bring your, you know, take something to write down and start daydreaming about your dream business. And from there, that should formulate the that should be the beginning of you formulating what your values are. Now, um, what's the difference core values and a mission statement? Uh, the core values for me are just like the traits and behaviors of how everybody works. We actually don't call them core values. We call it uh, how we work statement. This is how we work. We're cost conscious. We're hospitable people. Uh, we're concerned about tomorrow and, and many other things. You actually have 11 values. Uh, the mission is like, what are we? Um, the, the mission is another phrase for why do we work? Okay. And our mission is why do we come to work every day? So I can reset it word for word. It's to build a company that the world needs more of. One where everyday people are empowered to make great money, achieve career growth, and help close the income inequality gap. Our starting income, which I, I don't like the word minimum wage, our starting income is $19. And we're still earning 19% EBITDA. Um, Recruiting, I, I say this. What is what what is minimum wage there? Fifteen. Fifteen. So okay. we're we're well above that. Yeah, I've um, ne I've never paid minimum wage. Yeah, I never. It's it's. I I'm often asked like, you know, we were talking about this before we hit record. It was like, well, did you like working for minimum wage? Would you? To your point, would yep. you want your daughter working for nope. minimum wage and being nope. exploited? No, nope. and if you if you rely on paying your staff minimum wage, you have bigger problems in your organization. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and and I and I say this like for anybody listening um, that is having recruiting challenges. Guess what? You're not alone. But there's a solution for it. You just have to find it. You have to be really focused on it. I will, and I say this humbly, but uh, it's come with a lot of work, um, fulfilling work. Recruiting is the least of my problems right now. Um, because we have a show that people want to come see again and again, and that's our team members. And then our customers, because of that, want to see it again, because they like how they're, uh, the pro they like our product. Well, guess what? Who makes product Our products? People, right? Who's delivering those experiences? People. Um, but for those, you know, once your values are in place, now you have to go find people that are going to live within those values, because if not, it's just going to be something on the wall that nobody pays attention to. And one, my rule of thumb is 
you need to create interview questions related to the values that you have. So for example, uh, our hospitality mindset value, uh, we'll ask a question that goes like this, tell me, tell us of a company that you love doing business with because of their customer experience. Love that question. Now, you'll see people like their body language changes, um, their body language changes in that they'll almost like lean in and our, our interviews are primarily virtually, but you'll see them light up. Like this one time I was at this grocery store and that, 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 that. And then you might have a person be like, um, uh, I, you know what? I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, and, and you try to help them like surely you've gotten one good customer experience. If they don't have a definitive answer, I'm not interested because you don't even know what customer, good customer experience is like. And sure. Can we train you? Sure. Yeah. But the risk is too high and that you're not probably going to get it. So you'll find a job. It just probably won't be with us because we need to, people that have that customer centric DNA, they know what it's like, they love receiving great experiences, and they also love delivering them. So uh, identify your values, have some core values, or sorry, uh, some interview questions to match those values. And then you're going to know right away, like that person is going to put well within our culture. Um, a, a couple other tips here is I don't look at resumes until after like i have somebody saying this is the name of the person this is how to get in touch with them we set it up but i don't look at prior experience because i don't want to be jaded by past experiences or like let's say they used to work at the four seasons let's say right you might be attracted to that because it's the four seasons right but it might distract you from you know what this person's kind of a jerk so i go into it blind and not knowing what their experience is then if I go uh, to my colleague and say, I liked this person. And by the way, I still do every hire right now. Eventually the numbers will beat me, but somehow I'll still keep my finger on the pulse because it's the most important thing. It's like picking your spouse. It's the most important thing um, for the company. And so I'll tell my colleague, I, I'm interested in this person. What's their resume like? And then you look at it you're like, oh, they worked at Four Seasons and I like them? Probably going to be a yes. Um, but just be careful at obsessing over past experiences because you're more, you should be more concerned with how they're going to behave in the future. The past is past, right? Um, so those are a couple of the core, uh, the company culture meets recruiting slash interview processes that we leverage. So I, I just recently, somebody told me that one, a good question to ask somebody is, tell me your job, ex your, your work experience. March 2020 to March 2021. Right, during the pandemic. What, what'd you do? You know, yeah. were they a collector or were they a hustler? Sure. There was, there was plenty of jobs out there, a plenty of jobs to, to be yeah. Mm hmm And um, I have an opinion. Um, I, I will contribute to this part of the conversation by saying this, is that, yeah, there was a lot of people that, should have been in the workforce. Um, and I think they did themselves a massive disservice by not to doing that. Um, but uh, that wasn't me. So I don't need to concern myself. And that's not the people that we're working with. But uh, I wish them the best. Uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be hard. Um, now, in regards to the labor shortage, conversation that we we heard in Canada. I know it was happening in the US. Uh, I'm not too familiar with what they were saying in, in Europe, but I, I respectfully will say that there, there wasn't a labor shortage. It's that there was a bit of what you just described happening, but people just revolted, many people, not, you know, I won't generalize, but people revolted to being paid little and treated poorly, finally. The government uh, offered uh, essentially universal basic income, at least in Canada. Um, and then it came later in the US, I believe, but like a different form of UBI. It just wasn't branded UBI because that's- Right, it was, right. We, 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 we had all kinds of stuff that they could get. Right, so great companies weren't saying there's a labor shortage. Um, again, I don't want to be generalizing at all, but like you saw it and like, can you blame people? Like, it's a sensitive conversation. I understand that. Um, 
but I, I didn't subscribe to there's a labor shortage. Um, for- I didn't either. I didn't either. I had plenty of staff the whole time. My team yeah. showed up. Um, they performed. They did it. They could have collected. Any of my team members could have collected. And I, the first month that this happened, we were very wary because you don't know what was going on. And, and it's sort of, you know, after the first month, we're like, okay, you know, we're busy. Um, we need staff. Here's our, here's our, here's our model of business going forward. And uh, we're busier than ever right now. So come on back team within, within three weeks, I had, I had most of my team back. It's amazing. So, and the ones that didn't come back aren't here anymore. Right. So they just didn't come back at all. Yeah. Um, awesome. So the application process, how do mm-hmm. you, where do you find candidates? Are you placing ads? Is it word of mouth? Is it people that know about your culture? Is it all of the above? Are yeah. you on Facebook, LinkedIn? Um, what, I mean, where are you going to find your ideal people? Yeah. So I wish I had a very robust answer here. I don't only because we, we're always hiring. Uh, we do have a very competitive culture of, of meritocracy where, you know, if you don't perform because we pay more than the market, we provide benefits to full and part-time team members at 100% coverage and, and, you know, many other things. Um, if you don't perform, we're going to replace you. Um, and I, 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 I want to apologize for that because I'm doing my part as an employer giving them learning and development opportunities, paying more, doing compensation reviews every three months, doing a lot. So in, in you know, I, I believe I've earned the permission to say, I need you to meet me halfway and perform every day, every day, or I'm gonna replace you. So uh, because we've had such little turnover, we haven't had to do a lot of recruiting. However, if I do find a star where I'm like, I need to find a place for this person, I may, I will find them a role. Um, but if our labor numbers don't look, wouldn't look great because of this additional role, I may look for our lowest performer. Now, with that all being said, we look simply just organic social and indeed, that is all. No, ad, oh, part, um, indeed ads as well. Indeed ads, okay. Indeed ads, indeed, uh, and then social organically, but also our email list occasionally we'll send an email broadcast with better copy than this but like do you know somebody like a family member or friend who would want to join us right, right. Or you like, know you so. like us you know our values you know what we're about yeah everybody else to match i i have had such great success with those if they stay six months we'll throw you a 200 dollars 50 250 gift card whatever um because it's like placing an ad right you'd spend 250 on an ad here yeah. you know it, it's a 250 gift card is nothing to give hundred fifty dollar gift card if the person shows up to the interview you know yeah. just talking to people and that email list is so powerful and, but here's the one thing with a lot of restaurants if they don't have an email list of course i know and if we they send out a broadcast they wouldn't, know how, they, they wouldn't even know how to how to use it if they did have one we send out a broadcast and it's literally generates thousands of dollars in revenue Oh, um you're, yeah it's extraordinarily you. valuable like grow your email list grow them grow your grow list off. Don't then don't buy lists and just put them on your uh, roll your list. I was on your website. I saw you had a a, a point of entry for 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 your free your, your database, and I yep. also saw you had a retargeting pixel, which is yep. fantastic. So when I looked at your website, I was like, okay, these guys know what they're doing, or they hired somebody who knows what they're doing, which is hired. Just, just hired. As good. Yeah, this is so good. I yeah, I can I can sit at a table and I'll know what retargeting and, and Facebook pixels and all the verbiage and so forth. Um, but when it comes to the execution, no, let the experts do it. You can't do everything, right? Uh, now, if you're on a leaner, uh, like a lean, lean budget, yeah, try to do one thing. Go to udemy.com, go to YouTube, get the education for a nominal amount and start just doing one thing. One thing. And then do one other thing next quarter. Do not try to boil the ocean. It's not going to work. Right? <laughs> don't, don't boil the ocean. I like that. No, yeah. Like Beyonce. <laughs> I'm taking like notes Beyonce. here. I just, you got some great stuff. Yeah, we got a lot of things, good things going on in Canada. Um, But uh, yeah, so with the job description, or sorry, with the title uh, for the ad or the the posting, you have to think about 
what do people care about the most when they're looking for? It's like, it's a combination of a few things, but what's going to capture their attention? It's income, it's compensation, right? That's one thing. Of course, who they're going to work with matters. The culture matters as well to other things such as um, flexible schedules and so forth. But based on my research with fast casual restaurant team members, and this could extend to full service, is like, how much am I going to earn? Right? Because it's a very competitive market. Um, so what I did was in the job title for our team members, it says um, team member, uh, restaurant team member. And then in brackets, it says starting $19 per hour. So that immediately is the lead magnet, the hook to get a lot of candidates in your funnel. Not everybody at the top of your recruiting funnel is going to be exceptional. Of course not, right? But, you know, if I, if I applied for an engineering job, I should not be in that funnel. And there might be some people that just see $19, I'll do anything. Yeah, but you know, we're not just gonna hire anybody. So that you have to cast a wide net and then you have to go and, and filter through everybody. I like to host virtual group interviews for anybody that uh, gets through the uh, application process. Um, some other things that I do, and here is the, the, the tipping point in, that I have learned just in the past year in how to hire for these uh, like frontline team member roles. Get them to watch videos in the job description before they apply because you're trying to squeeze them out. So what we do in our job description, it says, you know, the first part of it will say the title, the compensation, start date, all the typical stuff you'll see at the top near the footer. And then immediately after in bigger text, it says, do not go forward without watching these three videos. And then there's links to three videos. One of them is 27 minutes, me talking about the culture, our values. The next one is seven minutes talking about our menu. The last one is five minutes that talks about our brand, who created our brand. 30 minutes, over 30 minutes of video watching. And then the job description, the typical things that you will see. What are your responsibilities and so forth? Why do, and, and then at the very end is a link at the bottom to apply. So it's a, it's a link to type form, which is like a, yep. a form, software. form software. And yeah, and we ask like seven questions, but they're short, short questions that take them no longer than 10 minutes to uh, complete the survey. Are they about the videos that they watch the questions? So they have to. Uh, so sort of. The first question is, did you watch the videos? Yes or no. Then it uh, asks, um, you know, what's your availability, the technical stuff, right? Uh, but then it also asks in, in free form uh, text box. It says, you know, describe the workplace of your dreams. Um, another question is, tell me of a time where you didn't work well with somebody. And just again, we're intending for short answers, but you see kind of the layers to it. Um, and I'm not trying to have a seven layer interview process like some tech company, but I am trying to see who's willing to put in a little bit of effort to be able to have a video interview. Because at that point we go through all the type forms and we say, that's a good answer. Let's invite them to a group interview. And then we have a group interview where there's up to three candidates on the video answering the same questions and I'm, I'm present. The first question I ask in the job description, or sorry, in the group interview, first question I say, tell me what excited you about the videos, something that caused you to pause and maybe rewatch it, or did you have any general questions? And then you find out who really watched the videos. If Marcus, you'll see individuals be like, hey, Michelle, at, this one person said this. And immediately at the beginning, I was like, they're hired. They're like, Michelle, at seven minutes, you could tell they're reading notes. At seven minutes and 27 seconds, you said this about Peru. And I didn't believe you. I had to go Google. I was like, yeah, hired, right? Um, hired, like pretty much. And then we keep on with our questions. But like, that's cool. Like that increases the likelihood they're going to show up to day one. They're going to bring their whole selves to work because they took time and effort to do something when the outcome wasn't guaranteed. 
they weren't guaranteed to be. They weren't right? guaranteed anything. They weren't guaranteed. They weren't, they weren't. They weren't. Right. But then there's some of the individuals that give you an enthusiastic answer, something general, or something that the last candidate just said. You're like, you just copied what they just said. Right. Like, I, was, <laughs> I was born yesterday. But that's, you're showing me your cards. That's how you're going to treat our guests without enthusiasm. I don't want that. Right. And again, you're going to get hired somewhere, just not here. Just not here. That's that is awesome. I love that. I, I learned a lot uh, on that process there. So, Ken, is this stuff on your website at all times? Like, 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 let's say somebody just moves into town and they find you, like, oh, let me see if this place is hiring. And they just go on and find an online application and, and, and go away at it. Well, they can go to our website. We always have the job descriptions available there. And, and like I said, we're always hiring. We're always hosting interviews every single week. I'm actually going to mandate that our interviews are always Tuesdays and Thursdays, just so it's constant and it's just a recurring theme to our company. But yeah, people can, um, right now the ads aren't running on LinkedIn or on uh, Indeed, uh, but we still post uh, organically on social. Okay. Uh, but you know, we're about to open three more units. So we are going to turn on those ads very soon. You're going to have um, to, yes. Yeah, because we need to remember, we yeah. got to fill the top you of gotta the funnel. You got to start big, right? build the net. Ex exactly. Build the net and, and, and right, and exactly, and put the put, put, throw the bycatch to the side. Can <laughs> I tell you an interview question? Uh, can, can we role play for yeah. this interview question? Uh, literally has been copied by hundreds of companies, including Subway's head office. So, uh, Marcus, let's pretend that you're applying it doesn't matter what you're applying for actually let's say you're applying to be a, an accountant a general manager of a store or a frontline team member you're going to sit down with me and everybody gets this question it goes like this uh, what is an indulgence that you cannot live without that costs less than 20 dollars how would you answer that wine okay great what uh, red or white Oh boy, white, uh, depending upon the day or nice, nice deep rich glass of red. Okay, okay. So pretty or, much any any type of wine for, for yeah, Marcus. But or, let's, let's stick with wine. Let's stick with white. Sorry, let's stick with white. What region, Marcus, do you prefer? Oh my gosh, Italy, of course. Well, great. Oh, Fiano. Okay, great. Thank you. I go on to the next person. I hear pizza. I hear cool ranch Doritos. I hear whatever, right? Writing these things down. End of the interview, you hear from us two days later. It's like, Marcus, you're hired. Thank you so much. Uh, we loved your answers, uh, especially when you started talking about Peru. We really feel like you're going to be a part of this culture. Da, 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 da. Your uh, start date is this coming Monday at 10 a.m. We'll see you then. Okay, Marcus shows up with three other colleagues. Uh, he's hired at the same time that we've just hired our VP of finance and our GM and, and three other people. So you're all together in kind of our learning and development room. And this is just a, a, a small room that we have that we rent now because uh, our head office is being built. But nevertheless, you're all together and you all come, you show up at 10 a.m. on Monday and at each desk, is a, a, a gift bag with a handwritten card. And the handwritten card is for me and I sign all of them. And it says, Marcus, thank you so much for choosing us. We, you know, you're, you, you're an exceptional person. I'm certain you could have been hired anywhere else. Like, thank you for choosing us. Um, and then inside your um, gift bag is your uh, ball of white wine from Italy. And what was the great part of me? F Fiano. Fiano, okay. Yeah. So great. Now, why do I do this? Oh, shucks. Thank you. That's so nice. Right. But no, there's more rhyme or reason behind it. Marcus, I'm about to ask you, and I say this message collectively as a group, whether you're an accountant or a frontline team member, I'm about to ask you to create great experiences for our customers, for our bank representatives, our suppliers, our investors. Shame on me if I don't show you what that looks like first. Oh, that is gold. Personalization. Wine. What type of wine, Marcus? White or red? What grape? What region? You know, that's what personalization is, Marcus, right? You have to dig deep, dig deep. You can't just cover a blanket over your customer base and just say, deliver good customer service. See you, in a, see you next year or, or, or see you next month. Uh, but here's the last, last reason why, because there's a three-pronged effect to it. You're about to go into your learning and development, right? You're about to go into training. It's advantageous for the company 
to have your engagement to be really high just before you're about to learn because you'll retain the knowledge more and you'll execute faster when training is done. And we did that by, by giving a damn and asking a $20 question. Everybody on this planet can afford that. Stop, reduce your Facebook advertising spend by 200 bucks next month and do this stuff. Do that. Right? It's, it, yeah, yeah. Um, it works. And I, I, I really regret that I've shared it so many times because like on stage when I do speaking or in my book, because now people know about it. So it's not when people join our company, they know that they're getting that. So I need to develop a new $20 equivalent, but for those, please, everybody, I, I was taught early in my career that R and D doesn't have to stand for research and development. It can stand for rip off and duplicate. Rip off and uh, duplicate. Yep. And for everybody listening, rip it off. I don't care if you give Model me, it. yeah, do it. I don't, don't reference me. Just do it. I don't Model care it. for the, yep. but if it works, if it works, please. I love hearing these stories. DM me, email me, or get in touch with me somehow. I'm a very unique name. So I'm, I'm the only Michelle Falcon on this planet. So you can find me online. Uh, but I love hearing the stories that come of this. So please, um, you know, if you could, if you use it, please share. The that, results. Is, that is awesome. I'm, I'm def definitely going to do that. So that was one of the questions I was going to ask you about was gift giving, employee gift giving, things like that. So that right there is, is fantastic. Anything else along the way, small things that, that make a difference, you know, like, 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 are there certain gifts? Like, for example, like to me, the luggage company. Yeah. They make amazing products and some of their products are very inexpensive. Some of them are more expensive, but you can buy somebody something with their initials on it. Yeah. To me knows how to do it right. So is, mm -hmm. is you know, maybe for a one year anniversary gift, everybody knows they're getting like, you know, like a to me backpack and you got to work there a year to get your personalized engraved to me backpack is 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 there something other gifts along the way that make a difference that you found go to the spouse or the animal in the house gift to that so marcus let's say i was one of your team members and you know that i have a dog named maggie through five-year-old rottweiler and i'm on your team and you know i have a rottweiler because i post about her all the time so I post on social media, it's fair game. You can gift toward that. It's not like, you know, it's not like, hey, Michelle, uh, you posted about having a foot infection. So here's some foot infection cream. Like, do, obviously don't do that stuff. Go to the stuff that's practical. So Marcus, if you, let's say I uh, achieved uh, an accomplishment for you, I hit a goal or I just was doing good work. Like you can give me a ball of wine, sure. But I'll drink that and I'll enjoy it, but I'll forget about it like three days. Forget later, about it, yeah. Right. But get something that stays in the home. So if you got like a rubber Kong toy for my dog with her name on it, I would see it every day. It would make her happy and always remember that you were the one that facilitated that. For what? $15, 10 bucks? I think we would do that every single day. Every single right? day. Yep. Yep. We've done, we've done Yeti, those Yeti dog bowls with the dog's name on it. Ooh, that's nice. That's high end. I right? like, I yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's rich for a dog. A dog's rich enjoying a dog. that cold water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, somebody picks up a Yeti dog bowl and they're like, wow. Like, right? Like, that's that, like. That, that it, dog's it, elite. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was consulting a tow truck company once and a single operator. I'm like, just take dog treats with you. Here's the recipe take dog treats with you. If somebody has a dog and you gave them a tow job, give them this for the dog. Like you're going to stand out. Like yeah. nobody's giving dog treats out, you know? And this, this there's, person, this person's like just so getting towed because of a flat tire, co broken car or something. And now you're taking care of their dog for him. I genuinely believe that restaurateurs have a responsibility to help other industries because we're better at hospitality than any other industry. Well, that's well said. That's <laughs> we are. We yeah. are. I'll say that yeah. proudly. And everybody yeah, we have watching skins. Oh. We have to be massive people, right? We have to know people's skills. We yeah, have to learn accounting, how to take... marketing. Um, 
It's a game of nickels and dimes and small dollars. And that's why I said, do I ever display I'm a restaurateur as a joke? But it's, it's tough. Like there's some times where I feel like Christi Cristiano Ronaldo is kicking me in the face with big soccer kicks. Like it's, it's tough. It's a tough, yeah. tough industry. And, you know, there are, I can tell you this. Uh, if, if a restaurateur is looking for uh, a, an extra uh, stream of income and you've got a good culture and a great experience, people are willing to pay to know what's under the hood of your business. Like I, I you know, I've had many, many people ask me to host workshops for their teams. I'm too, I used to do that, but I'm too busy now. Might explore in the future, but you know, that like, there's a reason why there's the Disney Institute. But there's a reason why Zappos have people all over the world come to see them. And you could do that at a smaller scale. If you're yep. the best restaurant in town, in your small town, maybe, yep. people, the accountant you, um, will pay you. Have you heard of Pals in no. Tennessee? Pals. Oh, they got the, is the Malcolm Baldridge Award. Obama gave them the Malcolm Baldridge Business Award. Uh, Pals, look it up, P-A-L-S. They're in the same, they're in the same market as McDonald's, similar products, and they kick their butt in this market. Pals, really? P -A -L -S. I yes um they have an academy you can go there and learn from them and simple menu great team and they do not do not open any other locations unless they have a vested partner that's been working for them for so many years right and they will and no matter how good the area is they will not open it up with the right without the right team they will not expand without the right team I'm going to write that down. I'm always looking for, like, it's so easy to go to like the apples, the world or whatever for inspiration. I love hearing about the smaller places, right? The ones that choose not to grow. Right. Like, we're right. just right. Like the, like, right. I love those stories. Uh, and there's many of them and, and yep. the pals, I'm going to remind myself of Zingerman's this. in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? Zingerman's. I've heard of this. Uh, you, you're the third person that's brought that up in one month. Yeah, let's check them out. They've, they've, they've got every kind of concept going on now in Ann Arbor. And, you know, it, it's amazing. The, you know, being part of masterminds for years, a lot of these people came to speak at our masterminds. And we got to, we got to meet a lot of great people along the way and, um, and some great organizations. Zingerman's came once. Pals came three times in the decade that was part of the mastermind I was in. Uh, they had somebody come three times from Pals. So beneficial for restaurant owners. So... I'd like to talk about ongoing training because a lot of restaurateurs say, oh, I did training. <laughs> training something you do, not something you did. So talk to us about, about ongoing training. Um, and then I also want to talk about how to, how to take an employee that was a fantastic employee, fantastic team member, and maybe something's going wrong with them in their life. Maybe they're in a bad place. Something's happening how can you turn how can you assist this person how how can you bring them back to 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 the good side yeah so uh, around training um it could be references training coaching learning and development whichever you like um but to your point it's an evolving topic like you can't be using the same training strategies for soft skills customer service let's say you did 10 years ago because guess what the world is digitalized now like and, and amongst other things it's just a different environment so you your tr your training materials have to evolve before the market does um or at least change really quickly after it does uh it's a habitual thing uh we have a, a learning management software program where i am updating um new modules all the time and it's me talking it's me, we have this thing called Brasa Masterclass. It's kind of um, based off of masterclass.com where I reach out to my network of individuals that I have, uh, who I'm friends with and they have an expertise in something and I just talk to them. So one episode was with Kyle Ardill. He's the strength and conditioning coach for Apple Fitness. And we hosted a conversation just like this about how to be healthy in the workplace and outside the workplace. Uh, one other episode is uh, with Balbina Knight. She is the director of people and projects at this digital marketing company in Vancouver. And we talk about career growth because she went from being a server at a restaurant 
to being this executive marketer in a short period of time. And she's quite youthful in her thirties. So I want my team members to be able to learn from individuals like that. So that is kind of like the evergreen education that people that. can tap okay. into and watch at any time. Costs very little money, right? It costs a subscription to a learning management software and a bit of your time. Right. Um, we just had a financial consultant come in, talk to our team. We have a lot of yeah. one, 22, 23 year olds that are making yeah. fantastic money and just stockpiling money and don't know what to do with it. Um, so yeah, you got to do some of it. The inflation, inflation's making that money <laughs> less, uh, less than it was the, a year ago. But yes. Um, uh, now, but, how, about, yeah. how about training, like specific training, like of the food, of the menu, of customer service? Yeah. Because yeah. I think we, I, th I think what you just spoke about is that's fantastic. And to be able to, to build, like for me, every boss I had was a mentor. And every mm -hmm. boss I had helped me get my next job. They took mm -hmm. me under their wing. Um, they didn't do it to every, every, every employee, but they took me under their wing. They saw I wanted to learn. They saw I was eager and ambitious and they helped me get my next job and they taught me along the way. And I remember one thing, one chef told me about finances. He goes, Marcus, you are so talented. You're smart. Never live beyond your means because every job you're going to get, you're going to get a raise. Mm -hmm. And it's tough because you're going to want flashier things, fancier cars. Yeah. And before mm -hmm. you know it, Marcus, you're going to be living beyond your means. And the money you're making right here today is going to feel the same as when you're making double. Yeah. Don't make that mistake. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Yeah, like, yeah, he's right. I was savvy with finances, but to have somebody, a mentor, your boss, tell you that and pull you aside and tell you that meant a lot to me, right? So this, uh, this above and beyond training, this life training. So we do, we do weekly meetings, uh, Zoom meetings, and they have to say something that they want to be held accountable for something that they failed at something maybe they regret um a chance they didn't take uh and then you know something that they've learned that week and it's a combination it's just one of those questions so we so the meeting's not forever but you know simply something something i learned this week at work was x y and z and that's going to help other people something i regret you know in the last month was or a happy customer moment Here's yeah. a happy table 103 on Sunday night. Oh my gosh, they hugged me when I left, this and that. And, you know, and it's just, it's awesome to hear these kind of things. So the above and beyond, but now let's talk about the stuff that they need to get by to get their job done. Yeah, so we start our modules will be first related to culture, then it goes to customer experience, and then it goes to product. Um, not to suggest that product is the least important. I just find that most companies uh, kind of skim over the culture and the customer experience part. We front load it, and then the product part comes after. I like micro learning, uh, you know, short uh, modules. Um, I don't like putting people in a classroom environment for too long. Um, it's just not a great way to learn. Uh, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Um, You're 100% right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So our, our 30 minute meeting gets broken down into like three, three minute videos, the three most important points. And then yeah. I put that on our online module and figure out where I'm going to plug it in. Exactly. For, for either them or for new employees that are coming in. Three, three minute videos is all I wanted a half, a half an hour. Very similar process to what we have also. Um, but, you know, once in, in our, our learning development uh, programming is after two weeks, if you're a frontline team member uh, or any role, really, that's the time frame. After two weeks, you should know everything about the job. Right. You should in, in for, our, let's say, our frontline team members, you should be able to know how to open and close a restaurant and cook everything within two weeks. Wow. And it's not because we put so much pressure on them. It's just because we're constantly going back on them with some more and more education. It wouldn't make sense for me to be to give it all to them over a two day period and say, OK, you should know within the first week. Yeah, would I love everybody to know how to open and close a restaurant and do everything in a week? Of course, it's just not practical, right? It's it's just it's it's not. So we've you know we've measured in two weeks everybody will need uh will be able to know how to do the role, um, but it's constantly kind of pounding that drum of learning and development. Um, I'm no different. Right, like I have to learn how to be a CEO and a founder, um, and it's not just one and done, right? Like my leadership uh, philosophies have changed over the years. Um, you know, I behave differently. I, I require different education than I did before. Why would we suggest that our team members aren't cut? Or why would we suggest our team members are cut from a different cloth? I, I don't subscribe to that. 
awesome, awesome. The you know the 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 intelligence intelligence is the ability to change, mm. and you know like and that. you know and, and doing things that we did five years ago, ten years ago, or five weeks ago might not be uh, might not be relevant. Uh, it might not it may, may never have been right to begin with, right? <laughs> the only thing that I've known for the last 10 years is that my favorite pizza is pepperoni pizza. Other than that, everything else has changed. Um, like, again, like I said, how I behave, how I lead, what type of education I need. So everybody's kind of come from the same cloth in that respect. So this, this is awesome. This is really awesome. We're, we're at an hour in right now. And is let's wrap this up in a few minutes, five or five or 10 more minutes, let's say. Is there anything else that we need to know that another restaurateur needs to know about building a team, developing a culture, recruiting techniques, retention? Oh, I, I, I asked you about um, how, how do you take an employee that's starting to go down oh, yes. the wrong path? They yeah, were a good yeah. employee for two, three, four years. And now all of a sudden, you know, they're sort of veering off and we can see the writings on the wall. And, mm -hmm. you know, most most bosses are going to say, oh, the writings on the wall, let them go. But that's really not, you know, I, is there a possibility? What are some tactics to bring them back on board? Well, if you let them go, know that it's your fault. If you're the one that hired them, awesome. that's an X, that's an X next to your name. Take responsibility right? for that. Yeah, exactly. 100%. 100%. So, that's your responsibility. So acknowledge that. And now when you start thinking like, wait a second, that's a bad reflection on me. You're going to probably put forth a little bit more effort. But uh, the next is understand, like, maybe this individual had a death in the family. Maybe this individual struggling with mental health. Maybe this, you don't know what you don't know. Because I know sometimes I've seen this where a leader will be like, you're not performing, Johnny, da, 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 da. And then Johnny's like, I have to tell you something. I had a death in my family. And then the leader's like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know. Yeah, well, now you're backpedaling and you look like a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, so understand Okay, what's going on? There might not have been a death in the family. Maybe Johnny doesn't want to be in this industry anymore. And if that's the case, well, then yeah, let's get Johnny offboarded properly. Okay, Johnny, we're going to help you find that next role. Um, we need four weeks, two weeks, three weeks, however long. Till the end of the Our summer. Till the end of the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um, we expect you to continue to perform every day. And just like you expect us to pay you every day for every day worked, um, and they get them out. But if it's just like, uh, if it's, they're just simply not performing for reasons that are unknown, well, because you hired them, um, it's your responsibility to coach them up or coach them out. And uh, if I'm, I, I'm not very tolerant of poor performance for a long time, especially when we are, coaching them. Um, when I see that, hey, they're not going to come back, I'll uh, make sure that uh, we offboard them uh, expeditiously, but with integrity. Uh, Marcus, I grew up and my parents lived paycheck to paycheck. Um, and I saw what it's like to see two individuals struggle to pay their bills. And, um, you know, it's tough, right? It's even tough thinking about it now. Um, so I don't ever want to put somebody in a position where they're losing sleep over how they're going to pay rent or pay groceries or buy, you know, buy groceries. Like I don't have like Marks, I don't have kids. Okay. So imagine if I did have kids and I lost my job and I was a single parent and the, the stress of how am I going to feed my kids tomorrow? Like I have zero problems in comparison to individuals that might have that reality. 100%. So I bring this up because whenever we let somebody go and assuming they didn't spit in our face on their way out, they did it, you know, it was a mutual parting or we just, you know, we couldn't have them anymore because of the performance. We make sure we give them a severance, right. Um, to, you know, it's, it's really dependent on, even if we don't have to, like we will offboard somebody within our probationary period in Canada, it's three months and we're not legally responsible for giving them a severance, but we still will because I don't want to have, be the reason that somebody doesn't feed themselves or pay their bills. Now I had our accountant saying, Hey, like, what if we're having to give severance all the time? I said, well, that means we just have to get better at hiring. Take responsibility. 
A hundred percent. Exactly. Right. It's like, it's like sometimes Stop the blame people, game. Yeah. It's like sometimes people live in a home without mirrors. They can't look at themselves and realize like, Hey, this is my fault. Um, being self-aware is a superpower. Yeah. Like, yes. Give yeah. me, give me one of the traits. I don't care about a high IQ. Give me high self-awareness. That's what I, that, that I think there's a lot of value in that in leadership. That's that. There you go. hundred percent. Uh, let's finish it off with, uh, it's pretty fun by the way. I'm yeah, enjoying myself. Yeah. Let's finish off with some financials. Like you talk about yeah. being the best paid, a uh, highest paid restaurant. And I know a lot of other restaurant owners are going to be like, I can't afford to do that. This guy's crazy. Like I can't afford it right now. And I'm paying minimum wage and I'm paying some people off the books and there's no way I can afford this. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that some people might look at their pricing and be like, it's not elastic enough to be able to increase it 20% to be able to pay more for our team members. I get that. That'll repel customers. So that's not the game that you play. Maybe you increase it a little bit marginally, um, but then you have to go, you have to be surgical with your costs. For example, one of the things that we looked at, we're like, wait a second, like in our business, uh, what is your knife equivalent? What I mean by that is our team members came to us and said to our director of operations, and then it got to me, our customers aren't asking for knives. So what we're testing now is not providing knives for our customers. It's just forks. Remember, our products are bowls and, and, and salads, right? Where everything's diced for you pretty much. So we're now reducing the amount of knives we purchase. There's some costs that we're saving. Um, two, do you need to have that product. What I mean by that is we're looking at removing the shrimp salad from our, our, um, from our menu because it has higher cost and it doesn't move as much. If we can remove that, well, maybe there's more cost. And then uh, the third part, which I love, celebrate being cost conscious. Make it a badge of honor for everyone in the company. So what we're doing, instead of sales contests, we're doing cost contests. Which store can reduce this particular line item on our PL the most without jeopardizing the customer experience? Right. Um, and making sure we have products available for our customers, right? right. right? Do it smartly. And there's just so but, many things you can do that that are that the customer never notice or never see. Exactly, right? So um, start trimming your costs now here. Here's the test. What are you going to do with that additional profit? Are you going to buy that boat, uh, put it in your pocket? Um, or are you going to say, you know what? I'm going to pay my team members more and I am going to bite my tongue a little bit and see if this, these benefits come. I can tell you firsthand, hand on my heart, it will pay. I imagine everybody listening to this plans on being in business for a year, five years, 10 years, right? They want to be. So what's a, what's a few months um, of investing in your people's compensation and watch, they will support your business. They won't call out sick when they're not sick anymore. They won't leave you high and dry. Um, I have a really strong relationship with my fiance because we support each other. I wouldn't marry anybody else. I wouldn't marry somebody that where it was a one-way street. Start thinking about the relationship with your team in the same vein and things will become a lot more clear to you uh, and remove the divide that there is between commerce and your personal relationships uh, in a pace, um, being benevolent pace, uh, taking care of uh, somebody other than yourself pace. Um, I can't promise you when the ROI is going to be it's definitely not going to be overnight, uh, because human relationships just don't build that quickly, uh, in a world where buying Facebook ads is really easy. And the very next day you can wake up and see all these click throughs, maybe, maybe some purchases. Don't be jaded by that stuff. Go back. I, I, I wasn't alive for this era, but. I respect the entrepreneurs of the 1950s where there was no Facebook or pay-per-click. You grew it organically because you had a good product and you cared about people. 
Right. And you did relationship. You did business old fashioned way. Relationships. We it was all on relationships. Yes. Pre-internet. The internet and especially social media took us backwards when it came to hospitality um, and benevolence and, and customer experience because we were thinking very transactionally. Where am I going to get that next Facebook acquisition from? What's right. my return on advertising spend? Like, Right. Let's go back to the right. old school. Right. How many friends did you make yesterday? How, how, yeah. you know, no, no. And for me, as a chef, I realized in the late 90s, working with a bunch of different farms, I was like, it's great to have people love my food. But when the farmers love me and the salespeople love me and, and, you know, and they're my friends, my suppliers are my friends. That for me was a full circle of, yeah. of being a chef. That was like, okay, I've just found out what my niche is. I just found out my calling. I just found out what completes me as a chef. It's the whole cycle. It's not yeah. beating up salespeople, buying cheaper food. It's not, you know, saying no to a farmer. Um, because I don't want to clean, you know, spinach or something. And I want to buy a triple wash spinach. You know, let's do a little more work. Let's buy us local from a local farm and, and do the right thing and support the right thing. And that, that was a game changer for me. And we're all about relationships in my business. I don't, if I buy something, bottle of liquor, I want to be able to call the owner. I'm never yeah. going to call the owner of Jack Daniels, never going to call the owner of Patron, never right. going to call the owner of Absolute, but the local vodka company down the road here or in California I can, they can call me. I can talk to them. I can go visit them. I can, you know, I, I can, I can like them. And li likeability is a big factor for me when I buy products. I have to like the company I'm buying from. I'm the same way too. So Absolutely. yeah. And, uh, and they'll take care of you. Uh, so yeah. So this was really, really awesome. Uh, amazing. Is there anything else you want you want to say about, about this? We've talked about so many things and I'm, I would love to get you on another episode and talk about marketing and, and scaling yeah. and, and technology, because obviously the way you scale a business is through people and technology mm -hmm. and you yeah. need technology to help, help train and build people. And I think some restaurateurs have it backwards. Like I need more technology to replace my staff so I can make more money when reality is that technology can help you build a better team and make more money. Absolutely. And I would love to come back on. Uh, I, I love talking all things restaurants. And um, like I said, I love being able to share some things that your audience will maybe try. And, and if it works, please email me. I, I love being, I uh, love hearing the stories of, of other restaurateurs uh, being successful. Um, and last part of your words, like, like I said, Michelle Falcon, um that's how you can find me yeah how do people find you on instagram how do they find yeah, your restaurants? you know I, i'm getting a YouTube. little bigger on tw yeah I'm, I'm enjoying twitter more but i've got youtube videos i've got an instagram presence instagram presence or yeah, my instagram presence is primarily for pictures of my dog in the vancouver canucks um okay but linkedin twitter you'll find me everywhere just Let's link up there. Go to my website, michellefalcon.com. Uh, subscribe to the email list. That's where I, I share one simple uh, email a week with some uh, tips and tricks and, and what's working for me uh, when it comes to all things people, being guests and uh, our team members. So um, to start there, say what's up, say hi, let me know where you're from. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Later, everyone. Bye.